For the last uh, three weeks, we have been using our time together to study this theme of idolatry in, uh, in the Bible. Idolatry is a major, major theme in the Bible. I've said before, it's on virtually every page, if not every other page, in some way or another. You might even be able to make the case that idolatry is the major theme of the Bible. Uh, And what that means for us is that there are lots and lots and lots of stories and texts and poems and all kinds of things that we could have gone and and looked at to address this topic. And we obviously don't have time to go through every single one of those, and so we're looking more thematically. The first week we looked at the nature of idolatry and asked, what is idolatry? Just just what happens when people are practicing? What's uh, behind it? What is the definition of it? And we looked at this paradigmatic story of the golden calf. And and what we said is that idolatry is the worship of that which is not God. It is any worship of that which is not God. And then we looked at the different types of idolatry uh, and looked at Deuteronomy 4. And I said there are two two types, two kinds of idolatry. One is to misrepresent God so that what we're worshiping is not the real God, but it's a distortion of God. And the other is to worship something utterly not God. And really what we saw is that those are just two sides of the same coin, and there really is only one idol. And you guys remember what it is. The only real idol is me. Either I worship myself and make myself out to be the most important thing in the universe, or I worship God. And then last week we looked at the uh, effect of idolatry. We looked at Psalm 115, which tells us that the idolater becomes like their idols. In other words, we become like what we worship. And so uh, when we commit idolatry by uh, worshiping a misrepresentation of God or worshiping something that's utterly not God, really what we're doing is worshiping ourselves. It's all just self-idolatry and and pride. And if we worship ourselves, the effect is that we become overinflated. We become proud. And so today we're going to bring this study to an end, and we're going to talk about the inversion of idolatry. And there's a whole lot more that we could say. There's a lot that the Bible has to say about idolatry, and and I wish that we could just do this uh, for a very, very long time. But um, I would probably stay fascinated with this longer than some of you. So here we go. There is, uh, we're, we're going to talk about how idolatry is resolved, how this problem of, of the worship of, of self is resolved in Scripture. And what that means is we need to give special consideration to a theme in the Scriptures that we haven't really talked about. And really, it's kind of remarkable that we've made it three weeks and haven't touched on this yet. Uh, in order to make sense of what Jesus has done and how the New Testament talks about what Jesus has done, we need to pick up on this other dimension that begins on the first page of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis 1, we read about the creation of the world, of the heavens and the earth, and then specifically we read about the creation of the human creature. And this is what the text says. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. This is fundamental for understanding how the Bible thinks about what it means to be human. What are human beings? Human beings are image bearers of God. Now, what does that mean? People interpret that in a number of different ways, uh, and I think that there's probably some validity to all of them. I, I think Uh, whatever the biblical writer means by saying we're made in the image of God, it probably is touching on all of these in some dimension. Uh, It may be that the image of God means that we uh, are, that we share something with God that, that we, that animals don't. Uh, Maybe the capacity for self-reflection, self-awareness or rationality or morality. It may be our capacity for relationships uh, that that we are like God in in, uh, our ability to relate to one another or maybe that we have some role in creation, that we're supposed to be his, uh, his ambassadors or his general managers or something to that effect. 
And we don't even need to settle that right now. All we need to know is that human beings are unique within creation because human beings are made in the image of God. We are image bearers, and no other creature is. There's something about humanity that, that we reflect God in some way, his character or his will or his nature. We are God's image bearers. Now, let me illustrate just how fundamental that is for the biblical worldview. Most of us are familiar to some degree or another with the Ten Commandments. Maybe you can name all ten, maybe you can name seven or whatever, but most of us probably have heard of them and know what they are. There are two versions of the Ten Commandments, one in Exodus 20 and another in Deuteronomy 5. I want to look at the one in Exodus 20. This is, this is how it starts. Uh, and God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. That is the first commandment, that only the Lord which when you see it in all capital letters, that's uh, the Hebrew name is Yahweh. Only Yahweh, the creator of heaven and earth, is to be worshipped. Uh, he is the only God. He is to have no rivals. He is to hold a position of honor that there are to be no other uh, spiritual beings in his presence competing for the worship that he is to have. Second, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that's in the heaven above, or in the earth beneath, or that's in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So, the second command is no images not of Yahweh, not of any other spiritual being. And why does he not want his people to make images? It's because he already has an image. Now, in Islam, uh, idolatry is forbidden because Allah has no image. But in the biblical tradition, the reason you don't make images is because God already has an image, and it is the human creature. And so to make an image is to deny our place within creation and our role as his image bearers. Third, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So the third command is we're not supposed to take or to carry or bear the name of Yahweh uh, to no purpose, to no effect, deceitfully, falsely, Something like that. Th th this command assumes that human beings bear the name of the Lord in some way. Fourth, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So the fourth command is for human beings to imitate God in taking a Sabbath. The reason we take a Sabbath in Exodus is because God took a Sabbath. And as his image bearers, we do what he does. Does that make sense? Right? It's all about being an image. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. At least I think it's interesting, and I, I don't know. We'll see if you guys like this. He goes on, Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. That's commandments 5 through 10. Now here's what I want you to notice. The first four commandments are mirrored in the next six. The first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. That is a command to honor God. The fifth commandment is to honor your father and mother. The second command is you're not to make any images. And then the six through eight, you shall not kill, no adultery, no stealing. That's about mistreating people who bear the image of God. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. 
in Deuteronomy, this is really clear. In Deuteronomy, it says, you shall not carry the, or bear the name of the Lord your God, Lesheva, for no purpose. And then commandment nine, you shall not bear witness against your neighbor, Lesheva. Right, it's, it's the same command for God and then for people, for your neighbor. And then fourth is this command to take a, a contented rest, a Sabbath. And the 10th command is not to be in this covetous frenzy. Those two reflect each other. The first four are about God and how we treat God. And the next six are about how we treat God's images. May, maybe you could uh, summarize it like this, because all of the law and the prophets are really just reflections of the Ten Commandments. All the law and the prophets hang on the Ten Commandments. And maybe you could summarize it like this. Love God and love your neighbor. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. Why love God? Because he's the creator. Why love your neighbor? Because he bear, their, your neighbor bears his image. Okay. Th this idea that humans are made in the image of God funds the Ten Commandments. And Jesus' command to love God and to love your neighbor, I think you could even summarize those two as a, pra as a call not to practice idolatry. Because you can't practice idolatry and love God, and you can't practice idolatry and love your neighbor. Humans are, are like God in some way. We bear his image, but there are some ways in which we're not supposed to be like God. There are limitations on us. We have a proper place within creation. And so now think about the story of Adam and Eve. And I know we keep coming back to the story of Adam and Eve, but I think it's a foundational story. Listen to how this goes and pay attention to the, the image of God in this theme in this. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Now pause right there. Is she like God? Yes, she is an image bearer. She's already like God. She doesn't need something to make her like God. It's in her nature as a human being that she is already like God. However that is, whether it's through rationality or the capacity for self-reflection or relationships or some kind of function as his ambassador within creation, she's already like God. But what does the serpent say? You will be like God, knowing good and evil. The word knowing, the at, could also be translated like uh, discerning or deciding for yourself. The whole idea is not that if you eat the tree, then you'll have a conscience and you'll download what is good and what's not good. The idea is that if you eat the tree, you will seize for yourself the autonomy and the power to determine what you think is good rather than learning what God thinks is good. The Bible wants us to learn good and evil. That's the whole point of the book of Proverbs, by the way. The book of Proverbs is, the, is teaching us what the tree of knowledge of good and evil promises. It wants us to know what good and evil is on God's terms, not on ours. Because... When we do what we think is good and what we think is evil, creation just deteriorates. Adam and Eve are not content to be like God. They want to be God. They want to be the ones on the thrones making the decisions. We all do this. Uh, th that's why we have this tendency toward pride and toward self-worship. Because we're like God, but we're not content with being like God. We want to be God. We don't want our position within creation. We want to be more than we are. We want to have more authority than we do. We want to supplant God. And that desire to be more than we are, that's what funds and fuels all other sin. Dishonoring God, making images, overworking, murder, theft, Sex, uh, lying, greed, thinking through the Ten Commandments. It's all funded by this desire to be more than we are. And so the first claim that the Bible is making about human beings is that we are image bearers. 
We're like God in some ways, but then there are other ways in which it's inappropriate for us to be like God. And when we try to be like God in ways that are inappropriate for us, bad things happen. When we try to be like God in ways that are inappropriate for us, we're committing idolatry. Uh, When I decide whether another person lives or dies, I I am putting myself in the place of God in a way that's inappropriate for me as a human being. I am denying the imageness in the other person. When I commit adultery against someone else, I lie to them or I steal from them. I'm denying the imageness in the other person. And what we saw last week in Psalm 115 is that we become like what we worship. And if we worship ourselves, then we don't become more authentically me. I've just become more of myself. I become proud and egotistical and self-absorbed. Idolatry does something to the idolater. It warps us and distorts us and overinflates us. And where we were image bearers, now that image in us is broken or it's scarred, it's marred, it's stained. And the biblical writers are keenly aware of this. They recognize that there is something so damaged in the human heart that we will never be capable of imaging God properly. Something radical has to happen. Something, uh, something to the core has to happen. We need revival, or we need transformation, or we need renewal, or something. Whatever language you attach to it, something radical has to happen to us. We need a do-over. So, for example, Moses says in Deuteronomy 10, And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and the statutes of the Lord, which I'm commanding you today for your good. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth with all that's in it. Yet the Lord set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them. You, above all peoples, as you are this day, circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. So Moses tells Israel to circumcise their hearts. Cut off the part of your heart that has a tendency toward pride and self-absorption. Cut off the part of your heart that rejects the imageness of God in other people. Cut off the part of your heart that wants to dishonor God and sit on his throne instead of him. We image God so poorly that something radical has to happen to our hearts in order for us to ever be what we were supposed to be in the first place. Another example, Ezekiel 36. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses, and from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you, And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So the prophet Ezekiel uh, imagines this coming day when God is going to do something radical to the human heart in conjunction with taking away idols. I'm going to take away your idols, and in doing so, I'm going to do something to your heart. I'm going to put my spirit within you so that you'll be able to obey, because you can't do that as it is. Something drastic and radical has to happen if we're ever going to be fully human. When we reject our status as humans and try to be God, we actually become so marred and so stained that we become less than human. And more than that, we are utterly powerless to help ourselves. Just like a a bad engine has no ability to fix itself. It needs a mechanic to come in from the outside to do something to it. Or just like a virus has no ability to heal itself. The immune system has to do something to it. Or just like a, um, a toy that's broken doesn't fix itself. It has to be fixed from the outside. Our hearts are so broken, they can't fix themselves from the inside. They need help from the outside. We need help if we're going to be fully human. If we're going to be what God made us to be in the first place as human creatures, we need God to do something radical to us. 
And this is where we can start talking about who Jesus is and what has happened in Jesus and how he inverts this problem of idolatry. You see, the first Christians made a very important claim about Jesus, a very important claim that if we're not tuned into this whole theme is going to be lost on us. This is what Paul says in Colossians 1. It's about as clear as you can get. He is the image of the invisible God and the firstborn of all creation. Jesus is the image of God. Now here's what that means for us. Whatever it means for humans to be created in the image of God, we see it in Jesus. Whatever humans are supposed to do as human beings in creation, Jesus did it. Because he's the image of God, Jesus is the ideal human. He is the original, and we are all just defective carbon copies. It's like at the U.S. Mint. You know, they have the original penny, and everything else is just printed off of that. He is the original, and we are all just defective copies. And we can do nothing to heal ourselves and restore ourselves to our rightful place in creation, but Jesus breaks into our world like a thief in the night, like a bolt out of the blue, to be fully human for us and with us. And if Jesus is the image of God, and if we are supposed to be the image of God, then we need to become like Jesus. This is what the whole story of the Bible is driving toward, that human beings are not fully human until we are like Jesus. Now, can I show you a few verses about this? Yeah? Okay. (laughs) At this point, you guys realize you don't have a choice. (laughs) Because I'm just going to do it. Okay, so Colossians 3. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and you've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So Paul reminds this group, and and he ties it into, you have died with Christ and you've been raised with Christ. He's talking about what happened in their baptism. And he reminds them that they took off an old self and they put on a new self. There is an old Parker and there is a new Parker. There is an old Brian and there is a new Brian. There is an old Susan and there is a new Susan and so on. And the new self is being created in the image of its creator. That is, we are being remade into what we were supposed to be. Romans 8, verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. The whole point of discipleship is that human beings would conform to the image of the Son so that Jesus would not be the only image of God, but he would simply be the first among many. This is why we are baptized, because Jesus was. This is why we gather with the church, because Jesus gathers with the church. This is why we celebrate at the Lord's table, because he eats at the table. This is why we spend time in the Word, why we serve, or why we pray, so that we will conform to the image of the Son. 1 Corinthians 15, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. In this chapter, Paul is talking to the Corinthian church about the day that Jesus returns and the dead are going to be raised. And on that day, we will be like him. We will bear the image of the man of heaven, but for today, we bear the image of the man of dust, Adam. And everything between this day and that day is about us becoming more and more like the image of the Son, being progressively conformed to his image. 2 Corinthians 3. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. How are we transformed into the image of Jesus? 
He says, by beholding his glory. As we gaze into the glory of the Lord Jesus, he changes us. Or it's put a little more clearly in 1 John 3. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we will see him as he is. We become like Jesus by looking at him. Our mission at Pontius Springs Church of Christ is to participate with God in making and maturing disciples of Jesus. We want for everything that we do here to be geared toward joining with God in this process of turning idolaters into people who worship and and are conformed to the image of Jesus. We as humans have to become like Jesus. There is no other hope. And the way that we become like Jesus is not by copious uh, study of the Bible. And it's not by doing enough good deeds for God to decide to fix us. The way we become like Jesus is by looking at Jesus. That's what we need to keep central is looking at Jesus. Now, this may sound pious. Maybe to you it sounds a little bit mystical. I don't know. That's fine. But the fact is that with our natural eyes, as we look around this room, Jesus is... So, you know, he's not sitting in the third row. With our natural eyes, we don't see Jesus. And so what does it mean to say we become like him by looking at him? I think we have to learn to look differently. We look at Jesus in the scriptures. Every time we open the Bible, the question that needs to be on our mind is, who is Jesus? What has God done in Jesus? What, what, why does Jesus matter? We want to look for Jesus every time we open the scriptures. But the scriptures are not the end of our faith. Mastery of the Bible is not where it's all at. You, don't want, you want to know where it's at. It's Jesus. It's being like Jesus. We look at Jesus in one another. As the song says, have you ever stood in the family with the Lord there in your midst, seen the face of Christ in your brother? Then I'd say you've seen Jesus, my Lord. We look to one another and we say, Jerry imitates Jesus in this way, and so I want to imitate Jesus that way. And we see, as we see Jesus in one another, this gives us encouragement and it equips us to be more and more like the Son. We look at Jesus in the table. If you want to know who Jesus is and what he's all about, we look at the table. Look at the Lord's Supper. Because this is no mere reminder This is Jesus eating with sinners again. Eating with sinners is a big part of who Jesus is. And every Sunday, he eats with sinners again. He's welcoming us to the table and reaffirming us of who we are, that we're people of a new covenant. I mean, we could go on and on and have gone on and on about the significance of the table. And as we look at Jesus, we're going to be transformed. We're going to conform to the image of the Son. We put on the new self that's being renewed in the image of its creator. We all have to put on the new self. And you may be with us this morning and have never taken off the old self and put on the new self. You've never experienced the grace that God mediates through baptism. And if you are ready to take that step, then I would love to talk with you during our next song. But first, let me close this with prayer. Our Father, uh, you... You are gracious and patient with us. And we're thankful for that. We thank you that you did not uh, abandon us to Hades, but that you uh, go into the grave yourself and tear the bars away. That you have gone to such great length to remake us in your own image. And we we confess our brokenness and our stainedness and our failure to be fully human to you. And we pray that you would please forgive us. We ask for more and more of your grace as we go into the week in front of us. We pray that you will help us to conform to the image of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen? Amen. I love you guys.